States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Go ahead and consider a motion to approve the agenda. I so move. Thank you. Sean, will you call the roll, please? Commissioner Ahrens? Yes. Commissioner Jibben? Yes. Commissioner Poppins? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Commissioner Landin? Yes. We'll move on to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move for approval. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Sean, will you call the roll, please? Commissioner Ahrens? Yes. Commissioner Jibben? Yes. Commissioner Poppins? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Commissioner Landine. Yes. We'll have our opportunity for public comment if anybody wants to come up and address the board. Nobody? All right. Then we'll move on to our commissioner reports. Any commissioners have a report they'd like to make? Um, Ma Madam Chair, I'd just like to mention that I believe it was on October 13th. I did attend the redistricting meeting in Sioux Falls. I believe it is at the community college is what it's now called. And so... Uh, that involved the state of South Dakota. I know our uh, state senator Bolin was there, and Representative Jensen was there uh, during the two meetings I was there. So it was it was an interesting meeting to get input, and uh, a lot of active citizens expressed their views on the uh, possible redistricting and changes that they'd like to make. So okay, uh, you did. I went in the afternoon. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Um, I will. I went to the six o'clock meeting, and will echo what Commissioner Gibbon had to say about having a district uh, inside of Lincoln County. I think was pretty strategic. Uh, there's considerable controversy, though, as to how they're going to divvy up the uh, redistricting for the state legislature. I got a couple of other things. One of the things that I failed to mention was every year the South Dakota Municipal League. And, uh, and the compensation fund gives awards to counties for their safety record. And for a long time, uh, Lincoln County uh, never really did too much participation. But this year, Lincoln County has um, received three bronze awards. They have received two silver awards, two golden awards, and two platinum awards. And that is over time, that is due to our auditor, that's due to our highway superintendent, that's to their diligent on reporting that, and that's a great safety record. So I think we owe a lot of uh, gratitude to our employees for their due diligence on providing a safe work environment. Secondly, I attended uh, last Wednesday, uh, the, uh, the state had their uh, DOT, held their conference here in East River or in Sioux Falls, and uh, they covered a multiple of issues that were for commissioners and better understanding on how the highways and byways and what you check. So it was a very informative um, conference, and it was well worth my time. The other one that I want to give is we got a report this week from uh, NACO from Jessica Jennings on the fact that the uh, NACO has been working very hard with Congress to see if some of the COVID and uh, the relief fund could not be used for infrastructure and for highways. And I'm happy to report that that is now uh, being taken seriously and they've sent out a, um, a method or a agenda or whatever budget on how you work on that to see what funds are we could convert from the money that we have received or are about to receive and how much of that we can put towards infrastructure. So that's a very encouraging thing. Uh, I, I think that uh, NACO has worked very hard. We've had many, many, many uh, conferences on, on this fact because across the country, everybody's frustrated because they got the money, but they can't spend it on the things they'd like to spend it on. So I think that's good movement, and hopefully that'll be uh, happen to reality, and maybe we can free up some of our funds to do some of the needed road work and things like that. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, and just, uh, just a note, Sherry, do you have those dates that we set the public meetings for on the redistricting? Yep, I'll have it. It's going to be discussed later. Okay. All right. Thanks. We'll move on to regular business. We have a second reading in public hearing. This is a second reading and public hearing for an ordinance of Lincoln County, South Dakota, rezoning the property legally described as Lot 1, Hoffman's Edition, Southwest Quarter of the Southwest Quarter, Section 31, Township 100 North, Right 50 West, from the A1 Agricultural District to the C Commercial District and amending the official zoning map of Lincoln County. Location, parcel ID 100, 50, 31, J001. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is an application from Scott Hoffman and his siblings. Uh, this property is approximately 2,600 feet south of the City of T corporate limits. Parcel size is approximately two acres in size. Uh, the purpose for this application is the applicant indicated in the application that since the property does not have a building eligibility, uh, that, he, that himself and his siblings are intending to sell the property and feel that commercial is a better fit for the property and better for their sale of the property. Um, as I mentioned at the first reading of this ordinance, uh, this property is within the urban expansion area as identified on the Lincoln County Comprehensive Plan. So then when we look at this as a future growth area for the City of T, we go to the City of T's Comprehensive Plan to identify what they've identified the land use for. Uh, the City of T has identified this particular parcel as future regional commercial. Um, the, in the surrounding area, the county has done other rezonings. Uh, this particular property was rezoned in 2015 to I-1 Light Industrial. This particular property has not been updated, but this was rezoned this year to Light Industrial. Uh, these properties were rezoned in 2003 to commercial. Uh, this property was rezoned to rural residential in 2006 to enable a building eligibility. Uh, this property was rezoned in 2020 to rural residential. Um, as you're aware, this property is governed by the City of T uh, for subdivision authority. They split this property and then the, the landowners approached the county to rezone this property to allow construction of a single family dwelling, which was done. The rest of these properties and Tower Estates, these are what we call uh, lots of record. These were all platted prior to August 3rd, 1995. Uh, they are still zoned A1 agricultural, but are utilized uh, for, rural re for what residential purposes or single family dwellings. Again, this application as demonstrated is in conformance with the comprehensive plan, general conformance to the comprehensive plan. Uh, the planning commission did conduct a public hearing and the Planning Commission does, as you're well, well aware, they do affirmative motions and the affirmative motion failed. Uh, so their recommendation for this application is denial. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have for staff at this time. Toby, what was, sta what was staff's recommendation? Uh, staff's recommendation was approval based on the comprehensive plan. And why did planning and zoning deny it, do you know? Um, there's. Uh, there's some neighborhood opposition to this, uh, generally the residential properties. Um, I believe that the Planning Commission, if I summarize kind of their analysis, is they really felt that it was premature. Uh, they, wanted, they wanted to state that more than likely, because as you've seen, the City of T has identified this as a future commercial parcel, uh, but they felt that maybe at this time it was premature for the county to rezone it. Anybody have any questions for staff? Are there any commercial operations in that area right now? All those ones in red are commercial, aren't they? Yes, there's a mixture of what I would call generally warehousing, but there is some auto repair and some other types of retail in that area. So is it light I-1, I-2, or is it commercial? The, the red is commercial, C, right? Correct. The red is C commercial. Uh, the purple is I-1 light industrial. This property is, like I mentioned, it has been rezoned to I-1 light industrial as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other commissioners have questions for staff? 
Toby, this meets all of the um, comprehensive plan boxes that are checked for this one? Yes, I, I would say that yes, as it's demonstrated, it does meet the comprehensive plan. All right, this is our public hearing. Is there uh, the applicant here? You want to come up and explain what you're requesting? My name is Scott Hoffman. Uh, I live at 1109 Southwest Avenue in Sioux Falls. Um, this piece of property, my brother and I bought from my dad's estate. That's been quite a few years ago. And we're at a time in our lives now where we're going to get rid of it. He lives out of state. My brother does now. And uh, so I went to Kevin and T with planning and zoning to get his thoughts. And he showed me the comprehensive plan that Lincoln County has put together. <coughs> so we thought, well, it's time to rezone that. And with the interchange coming in, the new Harrisburg exit or interchange, um, we thought that would be the way to go. But, um, you know, if you look at the map, you've got the commercial, you've got light industrial, and then to the left of that, that piece of property is also owned by H and H Paving, which has the light industrial. And I know they've reapplied or have applied now for light industrial on that. And then to the south, that piece has been approved. It's not marked colored yet, but it's been approved for light industrial. Then you have the Denai residence acreage in our corner. And then to the right of that, that longer piece belongs to Kelly Reuter, who um, I've tried to call three times. I've left two messages. The last message I stated to him what the plan was, and I was curious what his plans were for that because he does not live there. I talked to one of his co former co-workers that said Kelly had told him he would like to knock that house down and rebuild, but that's been a year and a half, two years ago. So now with this new Harrisburg interchange, maybe his thoughts have changed also. But he has not gotten back to me. Um, he's now down in George, Iowa, working for uh, Duralift. He's a sales manager down there for Duralift Company. I, I don't know what his plans are with that piece of property. Um, and at one of the meetings, it came up drainage issues. Well, Kelly's property, the long piece, the gentleman that owned it before, somehow, he put a road in off the highway and stopped the drainage and he got it changed into a, a wetland. Well, it's small. I mean, it's maybe a quarter of an acre, which has backed up water now into our northeast corner, which goes into Denise corner of their lot. That's going to all have to be changed. I don't know how he ever got that done. It's passed, but it got done. Um, which, if Anything does happen there commercial? I mean, T's going to, uh, the drainages all have to be taken care of before anybody can do anything. Um, I know they've, the, one of the questions was, is, uh, we sit so low. Well, if I stand on our lot and I look across the road at the residential, they're lower than I am. I, I don't know why that seemed to be a, an issue. I know years ago, I think there was a problem before they even started building down there. I don't think I think the county turned them down as far as letting them build there because of water. I don't know what happened. It got overturned somehow. But, um, we've also now, I went to Delapree Township and went to the meeting. We've put a driveway in now. Uh, we have a gentleman that's been uh, bailing it for his cattle. We just let him take as long as he keeps the weeds down. And uh, we put a road in there for him. And down the road further too, so we have access to the property. Um, we've tried to be as transparent with this as we can. I didn't, we didn't play any games and bring any plan and then walk out and throw it in the garbage. It's, it's just a point in our life. And like I said, I've gone, I went to T and this meets everything on the comprehensive plan and we thought, well, it's time to change. Change is tough, but it's time. Um, any questions for me? Any commissioners have questions? I guess not right now. All right, thank you. <laughs>
there anyone else here to speak in favor of the um, rezone? If not, anybody opposed? Come on up, state your name and address, I ask you to not be redundant. Um, if there's a bunch of you, if you have one representative that can speak for all of you, that would be great. I'm going to limit uh, each speaker to five minutes. Hi, I'm Drew Denai, uh, 27290 470th. I live just north of this property. Um, I can address a few of the things he talked about. Uh, the neighbor, Kelly Reuter. He does own it. He doesn't live there now, but that's been an ongoing thing. He had some flooding that he was not a, not able to remodel the house, but he fully intends on living there. He works out of town. Um, as far as that flooding and drainage thing, I know Kelly just recently in the last couple of years put all new uh, drain pipe under the driveway and rectified all that. Um, he does intend on having a pond there eventually though. So he's dug that out. Um, I guess I'm, I'm really opposed to this. It's kind of beating a dead horse because we've been to enough of these meetings and it's gotten turned down enough. I'm getting frustrated, but we're really against this. It's going to affect the quality of our life there. Um, like he said, he's, uh, him and his brother have owned this for years and years now. And I bought my house from Ed Hoffman, Scott's brother. And I approached him, you know, you lived there for 40 years, and during that whole time that you owned it, you didn't rezone it while you lived there because it is detrimental to the country living lifestyle, you know, who wants to be in, a, in an acreage surrounded by commercial and industrial. I, it just gets to the point where it angers me, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to change my lifestyle a lot, my... My stepdaughter can't even ride her bike down the road anymore with all the concrete trucks and stuff going by. Um, another thing is he mentioned that uh, they're doing this so that they can sell it. And one of the first things I, I did when I heard that they were trying to rezone it is I approached Ed and offered to buy it. And he refused to entertain me on that idea because he was bound and determined to get commercial value out of it. I, I guess I don't even know what to say about that. He was, he was arrogant, and it, it put a sour taste in my mouth about the whole deal now. But uh, I don't know. I just I feel it coming at me on all sides right now on my property, and I don't really know what to do. You know, the the piece to the north of me, that's zoned industrial, but really it's a guy with a fencing company that's just putting up a shop, and he was very transparent about it. He approached me, he emailed me his building plans, and he intends on keeping that acreage to the north of me as pristine as it is. He's just going to put a shop up on the north end and keep the half that's adjacent to my property the way it is. Um, so it's really not an industrial operation going in there. Um, I felt like he was going to be a good neighbor, but... Scott and his brother Ed have not been transparent with me whatsoever. They... They're just in it to make a profit is really all I can see is happening there. So I'm, I'm really opposed to it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Good morning. Would you just state your name and address? Jerome, uh, Jerome Miller. Um, I live at 46989 273rd Street, which is diagonal from uh, the property in question. Um, this is my, this will be the fourth visit we've had regarding this particular property. Um, at one time we had nine people here that were opposed to this. Um, unfortunately, I think I'm the only one that's retired. The rest of them all have to work for a living. And uh, it's kind of the whittling down and we're just the very few of us. Um, Mr. Huffman brings up an interesting point about the, the interchange that's coming. Um, that's 2027, if you're not familiar with the date. We just had a meeting with that up in uh, the T. Uh, City Hall, and that's when that that interchange is going to be rebuilt. That's five years away from the six years away from from here. So uh, right now, um, I, eventually, you know, who knows what's going to happen? I think this is premature of getting this done. Um, I totally agree with uh, uh, with Drew. I mean, I, I feel really bad for him. He's already got a uh, an operation north of their industrial where they're crushing concrete. Terribly noisy, terribly dusty. Um, his new neighbor would potentially be a great buffer for right there. Um, my wife and I just eclipsed 27 years 
uh, in that property uh, that we've lived there, and it's because it was rural living and uh, it wasn't industrial, and it's it keeps growing. I mean, I've seen a lot of changes in the 27 years. Um, they just approved the two houses, the yellow and in that Tower Estates. Um, if this is going to be industrial or commercial, then why are we building how? Why are we building additional houses? There's not much you can do about something that's been there for a uh, couple of decades. But anyway. The fact that there's been nine people here opposed to this, the uh, T County or the T's planning and zoning voted zero to five to deny this. And I would certainly hope that you folks would do the same thing and we can put this thing to rest. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Kevin Wheeler, 47022 Terry Lane. Um, I just wanted, I know. You said it fits the comprehensive plans, but could you pull up yours, Toby? Because it actually shows that it's more commercial geared towards the east side of the interstate. Um, that's where there's some conflict between the county and the one of T. So I just wanted you guys to be clear on that. Um, just agree with everyone here. We've already denied it with your own zoning commission. Um, and the comprehensive plan of the county shows it opposite basically of what the one of T does. So I just kind of wanted to clarify that, that the two kind of contradict each other. Um, there's residential on essentially all sides of that property. So um, I just feel, you know, we know things are changing out there. It's just a little premature at this point, so. Jerome, why did um, T, you Jerome, said, you wanna come up to the yeah. microphone, yeah. please? T you said that T turn uh, planning and zoning turned that down, as ours did as well. What was their what was their reason? Did they have an overriding reason why they did that? I think it was due to the public uh, opposition to it. I unfortunately I have the letter that I wrote. Uh, we get, we received the registered letter about that. My wife and I were out of state at the time, so I wrote a letter, and then uh, all the neighbors have been together on this thing since day one, since okay. this whole thing came up. So, but like I say, I do know that it was zero to five. Uh, uh, Kevin called me that night and said, hey, here's how the, here's how the meeting went. Oh. And they did read my letter, so. Okay, see. thank you. Yeah. Anyone else here to speak in opposition? Good morning, T can you state your name and address, please? Terry Mark, I live at 47014 Terry Lane. Um, we, I, I've been to, the two previous planning and zoning meetings as everyone else has. I think uh, I, I can't add anything uh, other than the fact that I'm sure you folks have great uh, uh, confidence in your planning and zoning board and I just really encourage you to follow their recommendation and deny this uh, uh, rezoning. Thank you. Anyone else like to come up and address the board? If not, oh, go ahead, come on up. Randy, Randy Haber, I am at 47018 Terry Lane. Um, we had just built my parents a house in the yellow marked right there, and that's right beside my property. Um, and the reason for doing this, we because it is such a nice, um, rural residential area. Uh, I guess at, at this point, if I was going to see that that was going to change to commercial, uh, I know some of that others is, uh, but to me that that is still all seems to be a, a great place for residential where this lot is that's looking to be rezoned. Um, I urge to deny any questions? No, thank you. Uh, Toby, there is no belt building eligibility there, is that correct? Correct. So and, the, and there said, never there would never be a house built there. Correct. And clarification too is the city of T did not vote on this application. It was our planning commission that voted on the application. Okay. And they correct they did have they tabled it the first time, so there was actually two public hearings for this application. All right, thank you for that clarification. Do any of the commissioners have any questions? For Toby, us? one more time. If they didn't vote, did they did they do any action on that? 
at all? No official action. The chief act. planning and zoning? No official action, no. Or they just uh, table it, postpone it, what? They don't have any action on this item. It's not under okay. their jurisdiction. Toby, when was, Toby, when was the uh, residential um, lots that we see there, when was that first platted? guess in the early 70s okay. it would have been prior to August 3rd 1995 this was one original lot and then the t city of T split it so then they came to us to rezone to gain an eligibility there this lot was replatted did not have an eligibility but at the time the board rezoned that to allow an eligibility there So would, would this county commission way back in the 1970s have taken action to approve residential housing out there? No, they would have just approved plats. Okay. They would have just approved the plat. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Are there, so are there building applications pending on those two lots right now, Toby? They're already built. Yes, we've already issued building permits and they're, they're built. Both residential. Correct. And there's a, there, there's a high power line that runs through this, and that's why it was originally one lot. So they had to, they had to get a, essentially a waiver from WAPA to put the house where they put it at. Any discussion amongst the board members? I guess where I'm coming from, I, I can totally understand um, both the proponents and opponents' points of view, but if, I mean, people still want to live there and there's a bunch of commercial right across the road, so I'm having a hard time understanding why the, a commercial rezone right there would affect anything if there's new applications and houses going up there. It obviously isn't that um, commercialized with those warehousing units of, looks like they're storage units of some sort, but um, I don't know, those are my thoughts. Anybody else? I'm gonna assume that back in the 1970s when this plat was approved, uh, it was obviously all agricultural land at the time. And nobody would have ever thought, maybe a few did, dreamt that, uh, we'd have industrial commercial expansion going that far out. Well, we do today. And interstate interchanges are highly sought after and desired real estate, especially for business. And especially in the populated area that we live in today. Uh, like Jerome said, I was at the uh, T-City Hall for that meeting where they talked about the 2027 interchange. I listened to the presentation from the DOT by all rights, by every single planning factor, that interchange and the real estate around it ought to be a future commercial expansion area, by all rights. But you know what? Somebody back in the 1970s on this commission, clearly a majority, thought otherwise. And now we're stuck. We're stuck with some bad planning and bad decision making over the years where we've got commercial uh, lots incurring upon uh, people's houses. And in my mind, a person's house is usually their biggest investment. I don't see anybody from the commercial areas out there testifying here today. I do see the people who live there. You all are the people who live and work and play there. And you're worried about your investment and your families and your livelihood. And now we're just doubling down potentially on some premature bad decision making. So um, at this point, because people live there and because this commission previously decided people should live there, uh, can't support the rezone at this time. Maybe in 2027, maybe after people move out of their houses. I do not foresee any more housing, hopefully, being supported out there. 
that would also be a bad mistake as well. Uh, it would be a bad mistake to approve any more housing out there. By all rights, it's a future commercial expansion area, and it should be. But you know what? We're stuck with real live human beings, and uh, uh, this is where they make their homes. And so it doesn't make sense to double down on stupid at this point. So uh, I'm not going to support it. Any other commissioners have any comments? Madam Chair, <clears throat> I've been by there many, many times, and Commissioner Aarons is correct. If I don't, uh, when 19, in the 1970s, there really wasn't much of a comprehensive plan. It was pretty healthy skelter, and we now are paying the penalty for that. I'm, I'm not in favor of rezoning this at, at this particular time either because I think it's uh, pretty important that a person's home is their castle and I respect the fact that they want to live there and raise their kids there and do that kind of stuff. What happens in 2027 is probably well beyond our control because that's going to be a federal uh, situation and you'll have to deal with that at that time. But um, given the fact that our planning and zoning board voted um, zero to five, I respect their judgment because after all, we appointed them and part of their due diligence is to uh, dig deep into these things and I respect their vote. Thank you, Commissioner. Anybody else? If not, I consider a motion. Madam Chair, move to deny. Is there a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? Madam Chair, if I may. Go ahead. Uh, sitting on the Planning and Zoning Board, um, heard the testimony that you heard today as, as well as maybe a little bit more. I think what is the prevalent uh, situation here, when, one of which has been rectified, there was no access to the property. I don't know at this point where that access has been granted by the township. But given the interchange and the traffic counts and things like that, I think a lot of the discussion was it's just not quite ready for the change of use. Not that anybody doesn't believe that this area, 27 years, I've 50 some years, it's it's amazing what the change has been. Um, you know, one, one of there, I'm sure there's a dozen analogies that one can say about trying to stay in the uh, stand in the way of change. Um, it's coming to the area, and once that interchange, the pressure from redevelopment into that area is going to even be get greater, I would suspect. So I, as a word of caution to all residents there, change is coming, as you well know. Um, but that still being said, this property, yes, it has a, a industrial on one side, but it doesn't on the other. It deserves to have some protection yet at this time uh, for that change. Um, so that is why I believe the Planning and Zoning Board was unanimous at, at denying it. It just wasn't quite ready for um, change at this uh, to a different use. Um, there's no doubt that it's not the right location for housing. It's not the location for ag as the parcel's too small. Um, but giving, uh, given some access and protection for those individuals that are in um, direct contact to this property, um, there, there wouldn't be a buffer then for them on any side. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any further discussion? If not, shall we call the roll, please? Commissioner Aarons. Yes. Commissioner Gibbon. Yes. Commissioner Poppins. Yes. Commissioner Schmidt. Yes. Commissioner Landine. Yes. Motion carries. The application stands. We'll move on to item number two on our agenda, approving an application for abatement of property taxes. Good morning, Carla. Good morning. Uh, before us, we have an application for abatement in regards to an owner-occupied tax code that was not administered by the Director of Equalization Office. Um, the application has been approved by all statutory parties, and I'm asking for the commission to approve the auditor to make the property adjustments. Um, it's in regards to South Dakota codified law 10 18 1, where an error has been made, and you have the 
opportunity to abate or refund. Thank you, Carla. Any commissioners have questions for staff? Move for approval. Madam second. Chair. Second. Sir. Thank you. Shall we call the roll? Was that second by Aaron's? Yes. Thank it you. was a close. It was a could have been a tie. I'll give the second to Commissioner Aaron's. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Aaron's. Yes. Commissioner Jibben? Yes. Commissioner Poppins? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Commissioner Landine? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. We'll move on to item three. Approve and authorizing the chair and auditor to execute fourth quarter LEMPG single signature sheet. Good morning, Harold. Good morning. This is just a routine document that I bring forth to the commission every quarter for signature by the chairperson and the auditor signifying that I've completed all the requirements for the LEMPG uh, fourth quarter of 2021. We have now started into our 22 fiscal year for emergency management. Thank you. Heard the request. Is there a motion? Move approval, Madam Chair. Thank you. Second. Second. Thank you. Sean, we call the roll, please. Commissioner Aarons. Yes. Commissioner Gibbon. Yes. Commissioner Poppins. Yes. Commissioner Schmidt. Yes. Commissioner Landine. Yes. Just as an informational note while I'm up here, I've received the qualifications for Lincoln County to become part of a presidential declaration with the new census and uh, factor per capita. We're at 65, 161, I believe, for population. They've changed the factor per capita to $4.10, which then brings us to about 20, uh, 267,160 dollars and 10 cents in damages we have to have before we qualify to be a part of a presidential declaration like we have many times in the past. So it's gone up quite a bit and uh, they keep changing that factor. So hopefully it doesn't go any higher. All right, thank you, Harold. Yeah. We'll move on to item five on our agenda. Are we skipping number four? Oh, I'm sorry. Nope, we'll handle number four. That's yours too. Okay. Thanks, Sean. You bet. Uh, so we did receive bids for the transfer station equipment and they were opened in red as advertised. Uh, what I'm requesting is that um, the board accept the highest bids as follows. For the 2001 Spectec Refuse Trailer, Roos Sanitation bid $12,000. For the 2013 Spectec Refuse Trailer, Roos Sanitation bid $5,000. For the 2002 Sterling, F excuse me, LT 9500 Semi Truck, Jerry Dean Miller bid $2,550. For the 2000 Freightliner semi truck, Rue Sanitation bid $10,000. For the 1983 Ford LNT 8000 garbage truck, Rue Sanitation bid $1,000. And for the two Arco lawnmowers, Waylon Wellman bid $700. And for anybody who was not present for the opening, the bid tabs. Um, describing all of the accepted bids is attached. If you would like, I can read them, Chair. Okay. Sean, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but it says Rue Sanitation bid $10,000 on the 2000 Freightliner. Yes. And then is the note in Seth Eichold's column, is that attributed to Seth or is that attributed to the $10,000? That is attributed to Seth Eichold. He uh, um, submitted a bid that could not be accepted per the advertisement because there was zero payment included. Okay. And um, either way, it was lower, it, so it wouldn't have been accepted anyway. And then the ones in gray shading, is there any, does that have any meaning to us? Um, that, those are the highest bids. And that was mostly for my sake. <laughs> no, sure, do, I understand. Yeah. Do you want? <laughs> do Madam, you want? Do you want a separate motion on each? Oh. I don't believe that is necessary. Okay. They were advertised as one. Um, they were opened and read all as one. 
Um, and I don't think for our tracking purposes we'll need to do that. I think they were also surplused. Uh, everything else pertaining to this was done as one motion. Okay, so, so they can be tracked as that way. The motion I'm looking for would be for Ruse Sanitation on the 21 Spec Tech Refuse Trailer, the 2013 Spec Tech Refuse Trailer, the 2000 Freightliner Semi Truck. The 1983 Ford garbage truck, that would all be for Ruse, and then to um, for Jerry Dean Miller, um, the 2002 Sterling semi truck, and for Waylon Wellman, the two Arco lawnmowers. Madam Chair, move for approval for the bids that we have received. I'll second it, Madam Chair. Thank you, Sean. Madam Chair. I have yep, a question, if I may. Yes. Thank you. Just to those members that did appraisal, um, and Sean, who are the three that appraised? If they felt that it was satisfactory for what the appraisal was, that's the only question. That was Thanks. John Hansen. Um, John, I can't read the signature, but I believe, I believe it was John Rombo and Jim Schmidt. Commissioner Schmidt. Yes. Obviously you feel that that was adequate. Yes. All right, thank you. We looked them over. Um, some have a dream, and some will soon face reality. Very good. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any further discussion? If not, Sean, we call the roll. Commissioner Aarons? Yes. Commissioner Gibbon? Yes. Commissioner Poppins? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Commissioner Landine? Yes. Now we'll move on to item five. Can you handle in that, Sean? Yes, ma'am. We have, um, we have more grants for the airport. Uh, next is the pre-application checklist. As we previously discussed at length during the CIP meeting, 2022 um, AIP grant will be the design of the North Apron reconstruction. Uh, the reason we have to choose this is because the aprons um, basically any road surface at the airport has to be a priority over any other project. So this has been de basically designated as the highest priority for our next AIP cycle. Um, and this uh, pre-application checklist before you was uh, constructed and put together by Helms, um, our engineers, and I need uh, approval for the chair to uh, sign page one and six. I would move to approve. I'll second it. Thank you, any discussion? Madam Chair, uh, I think two weeks ago, I was out at the uh, T Airport. Um, I went to a breakfast put on by the Experimental Aviation Association, had a number of pilots out there, and uh, as well as a number of supporters. My uh, youngest was able to get his first test ride on a uh, Cessna 310, so that was really exciting for him as an 11 year old. But we also had an opportunity, and this is more relevant to the discussion here today, to walk through the North Apron, as well as a few other parts of the airport that will benefit and be improved by this. And uh, I can concur with regard to what Sean is saying, is that uh, area of the airport needs the improvement and so I would urge uh, you know approval for the grant here today thank you Sean may you call the roll please Commissioner Aarons yes Commissioner Gibbon yes Commissioner Poppins yes Commissioner Schmidt yes Commissioner Landine yes item six Sherry good morning good morning <clears throat> So what I've got today for the first thing is to do the third quarter adjustments to the 2021 budget. Um, you'll see with the budget sheet, the first one I have is to do the budgeted cash transfer from the general fund to the highway department for $1.3 million and the budgeted cash transfer from the general fund to 911 for 250000 Anybody have any questions for staff? What's the reason for the the cash transfer from to highway from general fund? No. 
Well, the reason is because we have budgeted to supplement their cash in the amount of $4.8 million. So this is just the third quarter transfer of the cash to for their projects that they're paying for so they don't run out of money. Okay, got it. I would move to approve them too. Thank you, is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you, any further discussion? If not, Sean, will you call the roll please? Commissioner Ahrens? Yes. Commissioner Gibbon? Yes. Commissioner Poppins? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Commissioner Landeen? Yes. All right, the next part of my quarterly adjustments is gonna be the automatic budget supplements. Um, what we usually do is an automatic budget supplements when we receive get grants. It's not necessarily to receive the revenue, but what it is is to expend the money because we didn't have the budget authority possibly when we um, originally took out the grant. So that's what this is. It's not a, doing a supplement for the revenue, but it's doing a supplement for the expenditures. So the first one is the 9-11 grant, or 911 grant for when they updated the furniture and fixtures. They had a grant of 71,364.25. The next one will be the RAIF funds. Um, to familiarize you, those are the funds that we received from the state in order to do the inventory on the townships and the county roads. We, this is for the inventory only. The highway department is currently doing the inventory. Um, then we are going to transfer the funds to the highway department to cover the expenses of doing the inventory. So I want to do, I think we're probably going to have those done by the end of the year. So while we're up here doing the quarterly transfers, I was just going to include that one. Move for approval, Madam Chair. Second. Thank you. Sean, may you call the roll? Commissioner Ahrens? Yes. Commissioner Gibbon? Yes. Commissioner Poppins? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Commissioner Landin? Yes. All right, so the last part of the quarterly adjustments comes from the Domestic Abuse Fund. Earlier this year, we decided that we will um, empty out that fund every quarter. Currently, the balance in there is $2,644.47. So I need authorization to write the checks to Children's Inn for the amount of $1,190, um, the Compass Center for $1,190, and the Lincoln County Administrative Fee for $264.47. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there a motion? I'll move, Madam Chair. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? If not, Sean, will you call the roll, please? Commissioner Ahrens? Yes. Commissioner Gibbon? Yes. Commissioner Poppins? Yes. <clears throat> Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Commissioner Landy? So that does it for the third quarter adjustments. And that does. You have items seven and eight as well. I do. <laughs> oh, and nine. Oh. And, yeah, All I'm right. gonna be up here for a while. All right. <laughs> All right, so the next thing I'd like to do is I'd like to resend the resolution 21-10-29. Um, the resolution was to table the no ink purchase um, because of concern with the board's feedback and the public's concern. Um, maybe we need to take a little bit more time reinvest or look at it a little bit longer. There's going to be Brown County and several other, I think four other counties in the state that'll use it for the primary and the general election next year. So that'll give us a base of local, how it went basically. Move to rescind. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Sean, will you call the roll please? Madam Chair, if I may. Oh, go ahead. Uh, question though, if we're just rescinding and tabling that actually would leave the action still in effect. I think we were looking to terminate yeah, the we're action. We're drawing it all together. Yeah, so <coughs> just for clarification, it's not just to rescind the table. Yeah, right. All right, just for The that motion was to table until November 2nd, or the first meeting in November. Yeah. And I think that's the concern, right? Yeah, yep. so just for clarification, it's eliminating it completely. So we will not have it on November 2nd. All right, no. Thank you. Right. Thank you for that clarification. Does that uh, change anybody's motion? No. Okay. All right. Sean, may you call the roll, please? Commissioner Ahrens? Yes. Commissioner Gibbon? Yes. Commissioner Poppins? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Commissioner Landin? Yes. All right. So as promised, here is the timeline for redistricting. Um, the public meetings, we've got five public meetings. 
The first four of them will be at night, starting at 6 p.m. at the different locations. I have attached a commissioner's name to each meeting, and that we are gonna notice it though, so if more than three commissioners show up, then it's gonna be fine. Um, so then on December 14th, between 8.30 a.m. and the meeting adjournment, that's when we'll have the one that will be recorded here, and the other ones will not be recorded. So then from December 14th until January 11th, I'd like to do an open comment period where we allow input from the public, whether either in writing or at the public, or during public comment during the meetings. Um, after January 11th, though, I would like to, for the board to not take any more public comment. Um, then on February 1st, between 8.30 and adjournment of the meeting, we will set up the redistricting. And it's strongly required, or it's strongly suggested that any commissioner circulating a petition not start until February 1st, after that meeting when we have when we set the redistricting. Any questions or concerns on the schedule? So those dates, just so everybody, uh, we've got November 9th at 6 p.m. There's a meeting at the Harrisburg Liberty Elementary Commons. Um, the assigned commissioner is Commissioner Aaron. On November 16th at 6 p.m. at the Lenox Fairgrounds. And uh, the assigned commissioner is Commissioner Gibbon. November 30th at Harrisburg Journey Elementary uh, with the assigned commissioner being Commissioner Schmidt. And then December 7th at uh, T City Hall with the assigned commissioner is Mike Poppins. And then the December 14th meeting, which will be here and that will be the only one that will be live streamed where people can listen remotely. Is that yep, correct? Yep, live streamed and recorded. Okay. So just to confirm, Sherry, all of the meetings are going to be publicly noticed. They are. So we, because um, I intend on uh, attending all of them. Yep. Um, and that's why we're noticing them uh, in case you know, anybody wanted to. For example, Journey Elementary is literally a block from my house. Yep. So I'll be there. Um, and uh, the other question I have is, what is the plan to advertise these dates to the public? I'm going to have them online and the notice that we have on there. Let me. Let me find it. Oh my goodness. I hate running this thing. This is the notice that will be in the newspaper. It's gonna be a big box ad. I don't think it's gonna be in the legal zen, right? Or will it be? I hope not. Yeah, we're hoping that by the big box ad that it will be. We can request. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it'll run two weeks in all five of our newspapers. Um, it'll also be online um, and then it'll be on our website. If we run as a big box ad, we can usually get the JPEG of it as well that we can share on the sheriff's Facebook if they let us. They'll let us. I have faith. So, Madam Chair, if if there are if this is a these are public meetings, we can have more than three commissioners in attendance. Correct. correct. We are all we're five. noticing a quorum. All five. We're, we're noticing a quorum for all meetings. Okay. Correct. So if everybody shows up, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for staff? Go ahead. What did you say? I'm just going to say, I think, um, personally, I think we all should be there at all of them. Because we're going to hear from different constituents, from different attitudes and different viewpoints. So. Well, my reason for picking a commissioner was then you get to lead it. Yeah, well... I <laughs> that could be okay. <laughs> but I still think just for listening to the public input, it would be good for all of us to be Oh, absolutely. <laughs> are we going to have, um, at those meetings, can we, are we going to have comment cards or something so people I, can yeah, ask? Yeah, I was thinking about doing that, like a, the question cards or comment cards so that we can bring them back. Because when we do the meeting here, you know, if, because it will be during the day, if people want to make comments, I think it'll be a good idea to have the comment card, then we can 
summarize those during the live stream meeting. And I think, I mean, I think people are gonna have a lot of opinions about this and input. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if we can have like full sheets and I don't know if we have clipboards or anything available that people could use so they can write. Oh, we will. We'll uh, there's, I think they're going to have tables set up at schools. They're okay. going to have tables set up at the 4-H for sure. Um, T-City Hall, I believe they have tables there. If not, I can talk to Don and see. Rather than walking around with a clipboard, I think, sitting at a table might be better. I don't know. Sherry. Okay. Either way. Well, whatever works to make right. it Sherry, I was easier. at the uh, 6 p.m. redistricting meeting that the uh, State Senate, State House held. Um, I think uh, I see a number of people in this room who were there. And uh, what they did there was they had uh, blow-ups of the uh, maps Already so got people could look at them. Mm -hmm. That was very helpful for people to see. They had um, a PowerPoint. You know, it wasn't it was pretty basic stuff, but it's so that people could look at the screen while, while they're talking. Because, for example, um, myself bunch of other state legislators we were there we made comments with regard to um, redistricting that's going on in Lincoln County here and it was very helpful when we were making our comments to be able to point specifically to a you know geographical reference and so that the people on the panel could understand um, what they were talking about because sometimes when you're talking about maps and landmarks and geographical features, you kind of look at the map and you kind of think you know what somebody's saying, but it works out better when they can point to it. Right. And that's the one thing they didn't have at the redistricting meeting was like a laser pointer or something where somebody could say, right there, that I don't like that or I like that. And so that, I, that was one of the takeaways that I took away from the 6 p.m. redistricting meeting was allowing the speakers to just be able to visually orient all of us to what they're talking about. I think that would be very helpful. Okay. Yeah, and we, had our, and we had discussed that at the last meeting when we were discussing these meetings, so I think that's always been the plan. Well, right. Um, my concern would be is, like, at the 4-H grounds, do we have the AV equipment to be able to do that? Are you going to be able, the maps that we're going to do is 24 by 36, I think. Are you going to be able to point from that and talk on it. There will be a microphone. Um, is that enough? Type of thing. Right. Um, well, I, I think we have to. I think we have to use whatever technology is available. Whatever at the locations that we're using, it's probably going to be different for each one. So then, I for would a think PowerPoint. Or do you want to give me some direction on what I want? What you want me to put together? Are you going to put together a PowerPoint? What? Do, yeah, I'm that's just gonna thinking. Be my question, because this is coming. I mean, the proposals that that we've seen or I've seen so far are strictly coming from CCOG, that's and the I don't know that we're going to ha have anybody from CCOG. We are. We are for each one of the meetings. Yep. Oh, so and they can do the presentation. Sorry, if, Madam Chair. If we can't put it on a screen or a projector, then maybe we need two sets of boards, like so everybody's not. Yeah, know. surrounded <laughs> around one. Okay. Right. I just I. Didn't know where to go, how big we wanted to go on it, um, whether it was going to be more like a discussion panel type thing or so this is where I'm at so far. I've got the blow-up boards for one set, but I can get another set, I'm sure. So is, is CCOG, is somebody from CCOG, they're going to take the lead on explaining or? How? I think they're going to be there for questions. I don't have any idea how we're going to get the meeting. I don't know what kind of setting we want for the meeting. Okay, I'm and sure are I, you going to be I'm there? I'm sure glad I got the last meeting. The lab, the kings worked out by then. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sherry, what we've done in the past is that uh, we've had each um, proposal that was put out, and CCOG would explain their How they logic, got the numbers. and then they give the numbers, so the equalization numbers, so that they balance within the certain uh, tolerance of if they're over or under. And, um, you know, it, it, they kind of go through the, the scenario <clears throat> and looking at that. The other part is, you know, if you had, if you don't have a screen, if you had a white sheet, I've seen that used very effectively too, hanging that over on the wall, and they can get some kind of, they don't get a pinpoint effect, 
where they can get some a pretty good idea as to uh, what what differentiates A from B from C to D or whatever. But that's kind of the way they they ran that, and it gives the constituents that are attending there the opportunity to look at the boundaries, how close they may be to one uh, district or the other. So and uh, they can put down definitive streets. So it's pretty. Uh, it's a pretty comprehensive uh, evaluation of each district. So, because I guess I guess that's where I'm coming from. I think if CCOG comes and explains the process, the different options, um, people can leave. You know, ask questions, and then leave comment cards if they'd like to. I, I mean, it, it's p these purely informational meetings. Right. So. Um, I will talk to the CCOG person, and I'm, they're new to the position, unfortunately. Okay. So they haven't been through a redistricting before. This person hasn't. So it's all a learning curve. And all right. We'll get through it. <laughs> and, are, and we're taking public comment at these meetings, right? Yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. We Absolutely. Okay. But the, yeah, then, you know, the public comment part that I was talking about is, you know, if not that they can't make comment during any of these meetings. But December 14th till January 11th is about a 30-day period. Then I can collect all the information so that when you guys come to make the decision on February, what is it, 1st or 2nd? And it's the 22nd, too, by the way. I noticed that we're not going back to February 2021. But um, so then when we come on February 1st, I'll be able to compile any of the comments and everything that we had. We'll send that out to you. Then when you guys make your decision on the second, you'll have all that information. That's kind of why I wanted to stop the public comment on January 11th, so I can compile the information, give it to you. You'll have a couple weeks to look it over and go from there. Okay. All right. And like I said, all new to it, so hoping it all works out. All right, thank you, Sherry. You've got the uh, fan I do. request. I do. This is something we talked about for quite a while. So. Yep. Go ahead. So the conversation that we had, um, Tiffany and I had, or Commissioner Landine and I had, um, she indicated that the city of Sioux Falls, or yeah, city of Sioux Falls, city school district, and the Minnehaha County had all gone through the fan process. Uh, there's just a couple things that I'd like to kind of run through real quick on this, or real slow. Um, there are two things that are needed for a county to spend money. Spending authority, which is known as the budget and cash. Without these two things, you can't, you can't expend the money. Uh, Lincoln County has historically budgeted more revenue, or budgeted less revenue than what has come in and budgeted more expenses than what has been expended. So if we take a look over this, this is um, a three years reflecting 2021 through September 30th. I'm the, A little bit of this is to kind of clear the air. Um, so if you look at this, our net position has changed in 2021 by $6 million. Everybody may think that's good, but uh, the biggest part of that is the $5.9 million, 5 .9 million that we received so far for the ARPA funds. The other part of that is the 52000 that we received for the RAV funds. That RAV fund is strictly for the inventory use right now. Um, in 2020, the county had an overall net change in position of 1.1. And the reason for that was the COVID CARES Act funds. Now, if there wouldn't have been the purchase of the land and tea, that net change would have been about $3 million. Um, and in... 2019, there was an increase of 72,000. We did have the change in funds for the general fund of 929,000. But overall, we look at this and we don't have those large of increases every year. Some years there, we do have to dip into the cash a little bit. Um, and you'll see that with the 2015 to 2020. These numbers, the net change in fund comes from our annual audit report, which I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, so you'll look if 
uh, from 2015 ending fund balance to 2020 ending fund balance, the net uh, change was one point million or one million dollars. So in five years, we did increase the cash that we had available by one million dollars. All right, so the Department of Legislative Audit completes an audit of our financial statements every year. Prior to 2016, the audit was completed on a biannual basis. Lincoln County has not had a substantial negative audit finding in many years. And the audit reports are published on our website every year. And that is under departments, under auditor, budget, and finance. And there's the official budgets, provisional budget. Then underneath that is the annual reports, audit reports. We show the expenditure report for the full year and the revenue reports for the full year. So that I wanted to point that out um, just because I've heard comments that we don't know where they're at. So that is where they're at. The reason for me bringing all this up is to let you guys know that I'm planning on getting a financial action network or FAN together. The FAN is uh, compromised of high-level business and accounting professionals. Members will be asked to analyze data, provide possible recommendations about future steps the county may take to ensure statutory obligations are met and financial stability, stability is maintained. Um, FAN is intended, intended to provide a forum for discussion to ensure prudent courses of action are considered moving forward. The input of FAN members is important to ensure that the county's financial financially ready to meet challenges in the future. Um, this, I am going to probably, and I've discussed this with them, but I'm probably going to steal Minnehaha County's playbook on how they did it, because right, why rewrite it, um, and move forward with that. I think my next step is going to be is to get that, their playbook basically set up to look like for Lincoln County basically take out all the Minnehaha counties and put Lincoln County in there. Um, then I'm going to look at who I want, the people that we were, that would be interested in participating on this. This is an ad hoc committee, so it's not gonna cost the county anything. The things that, you know, we've got a lot of things coming up, challenges facing Lincoln County, courtroom space, housing prisoner costs, and infrastructure. So when we start this span, I'm hoping that we can see where we're at, where we need to go. I have a concern on our budgeting process. Um, I've discussed this with the state auditor and he thinks if I have a concern, I need to do something about it. So with these financial experts, I'm gonna make sure that the way that we're budgeting currently is the most successful. Um, other than that, do you have any questions? I do not, but does anybody have any questions for staff? Oh, I just want to congratulate you, Sherry, because originally this idea came from the uh, uh, Sioux Falls Chamber of Commerce to have organizations, regardless if they're dealing with public dollars, to do a evaluation by independents who are professionals in the field, your CPAs, uh, primarily your bankers, uh, individuals. And I think it, it does give... Um, the ability for this county to listen to what experts have to say and judge accordingly. Uh, a couple of people that have used this a great deal, uh, Dean Karski, who is with the uh, Minneapolis County, uh, has said that they have used that extensively in some of their planning. Sean Pritchard, who is the finance director for the city of Sioux Falls, also echoed that very same thing. And I think, hasn't a school district, Sherry, done this too? Sioux Falls did, yep. 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 And I think the reports come back that you have a, set, a new set of eyes that are professional in the field of budgeting and money and can give us a great deal of information as we move forward or maybe address the concerns you have about the audit. I just think this is a great step forward. Well, I wouldn't say it's concerns I have about the audit. But maybe I've, ideas. Or yeah, I just... <laughs> <laughs> Our audits are good. I just I think that the budgeting process. Budgeting pro I yeah, misspoke. you Excuse did. Excuse me, madam. You, you know, I'll correct you. <laughs> um, and the the other thing, you know, is I think it's going to help get everybody on the same page. You know, instead of I'll eat crow, 
I made a mistake in an email I sent out earlier this year. Um, so that's kind of why I want to correct that. So, Are these volunteers? They are. Yep, it's all volunteer. It won't cost county anything. And so will this ad hoc committee work like all the others where we notice it up for a public meeting? There will be the opportunity for the public to attend. It'll be a transparent process. Yeah. Yep. Um, there, and it really, there's only probably about three meetings. And I will, um, I'll get the charter and everything all lined up. I'll present that to you guys. I'm hoping, you know, end of January, beginning of February. It's, a, it's not a long, drawn-out process. It's they take what we've got, they evaluate what we've got and give a recommendation. But I believe that there are, you know, if we have two or three meetings, then the public would be welcome to come to it. There's and so I think many. when I talked to Dean, that's kind of how they did it. They had a public meeting of, or a luncheon or whatever, and then he sat down and they talked about it. And yeah, no, it's the only, the only part that's gonna be different than the other meeting or the other whatever, the ad hoc committees that we've had is it's not going to be send in your request if you want to be on this. This is going to be CFOs and bankers and CPAs, financial advisors that are going to be doing this, you know, higher level financial people. Will there be any, you know, the number one employer, I think, in, in the region is small businesses. Are there Do you want to use your microphone? Are, are there going to be any small business people on this, or are we just looking at corporate types that? Um, I haven't finalized who I was. I was looking more for CPAs, larger CFOs. I don't think there would be a problem with a small business uh, owner. I'm. Well, it depends. Would I, depend if they have the qualifications. Yeah, I certainly don't want to try to ace anybody out. That's not what I'm saying. But this is a higher level evaluation. What are the qualifications? CPAs, financial advisors, bankers, um, that type of thing is what I'm looking at. Okay. How many people? I'm thinking, you know, maybe ten, so that seven show up. I think when we looked at Minnehaha County, I want to say there was eight to ten people on those Yeah, they had ten on there, and some of them were the finance officers of cities, um, Sioux Falls chamber members, bankers, a couple CPAs. Yeah, they had uh, Ida Bailey, for example. Yep. And, and uh, I, don't, I don't know all, but they were all individuals that uh, certainly are no strangers to budgeting and forecasting. And that's, you know, the forecasting is kind of a, the biggest thing that I'm looking at is the forecasting of the where we're at, where we've been, and how, oops, how we're moving forward. I know when I, when I remember listening to the Minnehaha County um, presentation at a breakfast meeting, it was um, kind of a report card almost on how's, how's, how's the county doing? How are the finances? Are they doing it right? Are they doing it wrong? Yep. What can they do better? Yep. Um, yeah, and I, was, yeah, and I'd kind of like to look at the future rather than the past because we have the audit reports to say where we've been. I, this is kind of where are we going. We've, you know, we talked during the budget, budget process about our fear of running out of money. Is that a reality? Is it, and that's kind of one of the things that I'm going to look for from the board. Is it a reality that we're going to run out of money? Is there, you know, is our budgeting up to snuff, are we doing the best we can for the budget type thing or? Well, the other thing you gotta factor in is your growth. As your as the city continues to expand, as Heard, as uh, um, Harrisburg and T continue to expand and grow, I mean, they gotta factor a lot of these things in. And you just got your, um, you just got your report on your population and I think that's going to bear I'd like, I'd be curious to see how they factor that in. Because if we're looking at uh, a 38% growth and we're over 62,000 people, uh, where will we be in 10 years? Mm -hmm. And some have forecast that at 90 plus or approaching 100,000. So these kinds of activities um, or in, you know, to have these kind of ex experts in to come in and help give you uh, 
uh, kind of a guide path or a, uh, a picture of what you're going to have to face, I think is critically important. So I think we can use that for a lot of their planning as well. For well, if you take the county as a business, mm -hmm. and a business would see this much growth, it is just good, sound business strategy nice. to look into the future. And at no cost. And at no cost, yeah. best part. And I don't need a motion on that, I'm just letting you know that. And as I get the, as I get the documents, of course, as always, I will share the information with you. I'm going to be working through, like I said, I'm going to plagiarize highly Minnehaha County and City of Sioux, or Sioux Falls School, and they're all good with that. <laughs> so I'll be working that out, and then I'll be sending it out to you. And I guess before I get going too far, then we can bring it up again in front of the boards. And I don't know if you want updates until we get somebody picked. Or I don't. If, I think well, I good. think. You know, I mean, the process that Minnehaha County used, it was a pretty short-lived mm -hmm. deal, but did they, did they make a formal motion? Do you know about setting this up, or was there any motions that needed to be made on who comprised the committee? Uh, um, well, with Minnehaha County, it was a commissioner and the auditor that pretty much set everything up. Um, so, I mean, do we want to do it the same way? It's probably just easier. I don't. Sure. Well, I mean, I think we can do it kind of informally, but I think everybody would be interested in knowing who is on this committee once it's. Yep. Once um, I get, once I get everybody that says yes, I don't know how many people are going to actually say yes or want to be part of it. Sure. Um, then I can bring that back and if everybody's okay with that, then we can move forward. Okay. That sounds like a plan. So no formal action needed today. No formal action. Either. All right, thank you. Any other questions, though? No, but um, do you want to hang tight for number 10? Um, we had discussed um, with these ARPA funds having a grant administrator um, to figure out what we could and couldn't do with this money um, to help you know defend any way that we would choose to, to use those funds. And so in that process, we were you know, talking about doing an RFP, but then now Commissioner Schmidt has come forward and saying they're gonna loosen up, maybe loosen up the strings on some of these funds. Um, so I don't know if this is, I don't wanna say it's premature because there are deadlines that apply. So I don't know how the board wants to move forward with it, but Commissioner Poppins, um, you had kind of brought this at least to my attention. What? What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think it's an ever-changing situation as Commissioner Schmidt has, there's a movement now to try to loosen the reins, but again, we don't know unless Commissioner Schmidt, your knowledge of the, what the national leaders will do for us. Um, I, something I that we need to be cognizant of is to make sure that we do the procedures properly and, and make sure that we're not uh, doing things improper. I'm not redundant there, but. Um, so uh, looking into this and speaking with a couple of individuals that have worked in grant writing and things like that, um, a proposal was to potentially hire someone that is an expertise, expertise uh, in this field um, and that we should employ then that individual over the period of time of how to implement, not only write it, but implement any grant. Um, so I think it would still be appropriate unless we knew for sure um, that we're going to have loosened reins and not have to follow nearly the guidelines that typical grants require. So we're still in limbo. Um, I think this is an avenue to go down. We have a deadline unless, again, that was supposed to be October 31st. They moved that now to July or uh, January 31st for some paperwork that needs to get in. Um, the biggest catalyst for this is if we did uh, indicate uh, by the individuals I spoke with, that there are opportunities that we could utilize this money potentially for building structure if it's met meets the pandemic uh, requirements that has been outlined by the current guidelines now my those guidelines are my understanding is that the s3011 is going to let you use up to 10 million dollars as a lost revenue which means it goes into the general fund and i misspoke when i talked to you earlier it means it goes into the general fund and you use it as you see fit. 
Yeah, I, again, that would free up Which means there's eliminate no strings. a lot of strings for us. But that being said, we still don't know if that's for sure. I do want to make right. sure that we have something, um, an idea at least ready to go if we do not get that opportunity. Because we still then will have a little bit of funds that have to get um, follow some guidelines that we don't want to want to lose by any means. So. I guess where I'm where I'm at on this too is just. I think we should move forward with the RFP. This, the grant funds can be used to pay for advertising this and what have you. So um, I think we should move forward to that because we are under that timeline if we are gonna end up looking at having somebody administer these grant funds. Um, are, these so grants, are these grants competitive? No, we already have no, the money have sitting the money. in the bank. You have the money. We just have to be able to justify how we spend it. If they, if this 3011 doesn't open up. In speaking with individuals, it is fairly complicated right now, the way things are written. So I, w I would like to have a motion, you know, to do the RFP for this administ grant administrator position. We may not ever need to fill it, um, but at least that process would be complete um, if we were going to move forward with it. I'm not opposed to have a, having someone uh, do the complicated work. Uh, I was just wondering on trying to find a grant writer who is worth their salt or that can understand that gets to be kind of complicated because uh, I've written, I don't know how many grants and I'm sure Commissioner Gibbon has written grants in, in education. And sometimes, you know, grant writers will do it on a contingent. They'll take a certain percentage or whatever they get. I don't, I never like those because, uh, well, I just, I just find that to be uh, a waste. But I'm, I'm not opposed to having a grant writer, but I want to know the timeline because on Friday we have this meeting, our bank board has a meeting, and we'll get a further clarification just how close Congress is to changing this. Well, and this isn't this isn't a grant writer. No, this is I mean, somebody this, to administer yeah. the funds that we already have. You know, it gets complicated because if Congress passes an infrastructure bill, uh, I don't know what the implications are going to be on that. But uh, there are counties already that have been notified on how much of their total expenditures they can transfer and use for infrastructure. Uh, Yankton it's County. Not, no, it's they were listed is, on the website. Right, but what that is is it's the revenue loss report. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's transferred for infrastructure. It means yeah. they can replenish their revenues by the million dollars on their revenue loss report. So, so it's not earmarked for infrastructure. Yeah. They can use it when what they want to. That's well, out of the current ARP fund funding. Yep, in which right. we, sh we should have received that formula already. Yep. And guess who did it? Yeah. And it was yeah. the revenue <laughs> loss was what? It was was it five hundred and some thousand? It was less than that. It was only like one hundred and eighty nine thousand. Okay. Um, oh, I was thinking over time. Okay. Yeah. The yeah, you're thinking of the CARES may money maybe. Okay. Um, the revenue loss is a spreadsheet that you do to show this is what my growth was over this amount of time. This is what it should have been. Here's my revenue loss. Our growth, fortunately unfortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, has not changed that much over the pandemic. So we had, I think, 1% change. So for the board and everyone listening and watching and presence today, those funds can actually go into the general fund to replenish uh, out of that, our funding, so. Yep, I'm having verified that the spreadsheet is done correctly. Yep. Um, just because I don't want to, I want to make sure that's what I do. Sherry, um, didn't you say too that the counties that are able to recoup more of those were ones that have jails? They are, yeah, and I think it, and I think the reason for that is because they were putting more people out on bond rather than having them in jail, jail. so that was the lost revenue from that. Okay, I can't confirm that without talking to all of them, but it seems to be the a trend. Yeah, yeah. So just so I understand, you're. I guess there's two different discussions going on that I'm, uh -huh. hearing. I'm hearing three different discussions. First one with regard to the grant administrator. So 
we're going to, the proposal I'm hearing is this is an RFP, but then who, who is this person or entity that you have in mind who would respond to the I don't RFP? have anybody in mind. That's, I don't have. Do you even know that there is such an entity or a person who will do this? Oh, I'm sure I, that there is. I'm, I have, just by the fact that the people that I spoke with about that do grant writing, I do believe that individuals will be applying for this type of position. A lot of it will depend on how we set up the compensation in the RFP, which is part of what we have to discuss, so. And then. Um, Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, no, that's what I'm trying to figure out is um, if you've talked to these people, if you'd be willing to uh, kind of share with us what you've heard so we can try to figure this thing out. It's a complicated, uh, as anything coming from the federal government is, um, so trying to make this work to our advantage for projects that we're looking that are brick and mortar um, gets a lot more complicated. This The premise of the, the funds are pa for pandemic and health-related responses, so if you design your anything that you're proposing to do to be in response or to take action because of that in the future. Um, it gives you a lot of uh, liberties. Uh, again, this is not something I su would per support that all of this funding go to just county direct. I would hope that this could go to communities such as Harrisburg T, Lennox, Worthing, all of those inside of Lincoln County that may have other needs that need to be addressed. Um, but that would be also implemented into this um, planning process. So it's, you know, it's just a matter of having that for individual that has been experienced uh, or entity that it's experienced in um, interpreting what is required and making sure that we follow it. Now, this is definitely unique because we already have the money versus a typical grant where you write a grant and hopefully you get the funds. We have the funds, we just have a, a a document that tells you how to utilize it. Again, Commissioner Schmidt and, and Madam Auditor has talked to today about possibly the federal government loosening the reins on how to spend that money, which would be advantageous in a lot of ways. Um, but again, I'm not confident uh, by anything that comes out of the federal government anymore, so. I think the key is what you said, Commissioner Poppins' experience. The other thing is, uh, I know this isn't uh, a requirement that they are a grant writer, but it really does help if they have written some grants yep. to go through the The, the premise of what uh, I worked on this for um, is to find a way in which we can utilize this funding. Let's point blank, we are in desperate need of courtrooms. Uh, we've had an ad hoc committee for months trying, and the biggest stumbling block that I kept hearing is how do we get it paid for? So if this lessens the burden onto the taxpayers directly, I am totally in favor of trying to move forward with that. So. The one thing that I have found with grants, in, and I'll disagree with Commissioner Schmidt here, is that I've, I've had a lot of success with people writing grants if they're also given a salary plus a little incentive if the grant is accepted and, and allocated because it makes them a little bit more motivated and a little more accountable as well. So. Um, you know, I, I, I think these are some positive ideas um, that we're sharing today. So is there a thought to move forward with an RFP to see if there is anybody out there that would be willing to, uh, to help us with this? I, th I think it's pertinent to, do, to uh, continue with the process, um, and, but yet stay optimistic that maybe the reins come loose a little bit, but again, I think for our diligence, we need to keep moving in the in a positive direction, so. I would move that we uh, advertise for an RFP for this position. And who's gonna do the RF, write the RFP specifically? No. Bill? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can work. Better can, than me. <laughs> I can work with um, Deputy Golden and uh, coming up with that. Is there a second? I encourage a second, if I may, Madam Chair, Liberty, for although there is not ahead. a second, that we at least proceed with this. This doesn't lock us into it by any means, but hopefully, again, we're, our e emphasis is to try to find uh, revenue sources uh, that are advantageous 
to minimize the direct need that we have of the county, and that is space for courtrooms at the present time. So we, um, we aren't deciding a salary or anything. At no, this we got to do the RFP, and that would have to come back for approval to get advertised for. There's paperwork that's going to have to be filed by January 30th. If we're going to have somebody need to do that paperwork for us. We need to move on it sooner rather than later. So that's why the request is for the RFP. It doesn't mean we're ever going to fill it, um, but let's see what interest is out there um, is what my thoughts are. I'll second it for discussion and, um, you know, at Thank this you. stage for support, but down the road, I mean, it depends how it all transpires. Absolutely. I, th I just think it's a, it's a step that we need to keep moving uh, hopefully for now uh, there may be a, a, a door that opens up for us that we don't currently see uh, but this is what's I think in front of us at the moment so thank you yeah Commissioner Poppins I, I, I agree with you broadly speaking in terms of we've got to keep moving the ball down the field and we got to keep exploring our options that's for sure um, uh, I, I don't know if I'm gonna support approval of an RFP at this point but I'll uh, support drawing it up because I, I have heard some discussions around the state including from other county commissioners that they are seeking avenues to be able to use their ARP funds and there's also talk among other county commissioners of wanting to uh, commission some kind of legal review here in the state that would apply to all different counties that can find a way of whether it is permissible to exchange ARP funds. Um, I know that the bonding companies are obviously very interested in determining this. I've talked to uh, City of Harrisburg. Uh, they are very interested in figuring out if we could commoditize or securitize ARP funds and, uh, um, you know, in terms of who responds to the RFP here, I could maybe foresee, um, maybe not necessarily a grant writer, but I could maybe foresee a law firm who, or a accounting firm who specializes in this kind of uh, uh, federal compliance issues to be able to grease the skids, if you will, to figure out what all the permissible avenues and routes are of being able to to use the ARP money. And I know that um, uh, the uh, Lawrence County Commission is looking at this, I believe, if I'm uh, not mistaken, I think that's Talbot Resorik. Um, he's either on Pennington County or Lawrence County is looking at this. I do know that uh, Todd Meyer Henry from the bonding companies, Toby Morris, they've all supported us looking into this as well. Now, whether or not the best approach is a grant administrator at this point, I don't know, but I am willing to explore that more because I do believe there is a way to, uh, uh, you know, here at the state level, when you look at our economic development code, um, it does look like it's permissible to enter into these kinds of local agreements. The question is, what are the uh, strings attached to the federal money? Will they allow us to enter into those kinds of local agreements between the county commission and other entities? Um, I sat down with Toby Morris on Friday for about an hour and a half to discuss this. He, you know, of course, he represents a bonding company, but he seemed to believe that it is a permissible way forward. So I think we do need to explore that, and uh, I am open to, uh, to, uh, you know, wanting to explore this. Now, whether the RFP is going to embrace that type of look or not, I don't know, but certainly open to it. So I, I'm going to support this. And I'm open to any idea that uh, avenue that allows the taxpayers of Lincoln County to benefit from this programming so that um, we can move forward with uh, some of our needs. So, Not to belabor this, but Brown County's experimenting with borrowing the money <laughs> and laundering it in that way. They borrow it to... <laughs> Townships, they yeah, I'm not even going to comment on <laughs> whether what what entities do they're, that, but they're anyway, borrowing their money and uh, getting, getting it paid back. There's a lot of crazy ideas out there, and Commissioner Aaron's. That's one of the things you mentioned. One of the things that the state oh. association is checking into, also, is the looking for 
uh, some kind of uh, avenue for all counties to be able to uh, utilize their funds. And if you can imagine, this is just South Dakota, but it's across the country, the entire nation that has the same frustration with this money. And I think that's why Congress is moving. I should, I should add to you, we all have a board meeting on Friday, and maybe there will be more clarification coming from uh, from NACO's uh, lobbying efforts in Congress. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Call the question, Madam Chair. I would. Sean, may you call the roll, please? I do need clarification. Um, is the motion to authorize Mr. Goldman and Commissioner Landine to create this RFP? Yeah, I, if I may, Madam Chair, yes. Obviously, we do not have the RFP to be advertised, so we need to create the RFP. And that'll have to come back for ratification, I believe, to, and correct me if I'm wrong, Madam Chair, but for it to actually be presented to be advertised. So this is just to move forward with developing this RFP, so. Okay, thank and you. And perhaps we don't need a, any formal motion on it, but we've, we've well, got I, one anyway. It's, so. it's creating a new position <laughs> Uh, though I believe it would be a temporary position in terms of years, but I do think we need to have action as it is a change in our So this operating. is just to move forward with creating an RFP for a grant yep. administrator. Yep. Okay. Does that change anybody's motion? Not mine. Okay, everybody's on board, same. Everybody knows what we're voting on. Okay. Commissioner Ahrens? Yes. Commissioner Gibbon? Yes. Commissioner Poppins? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Commissioner Landine? Yes. And Commissioner yeah. Schmidt, I, uh, if we need to do something to contact our legislators in D.C., let us know so we could simplify. Um, well, that, that will be on the agenda, Commissioner. Um, Thank you. Were there any requests for executive session today? All right. Um, with that, adjourn. I consider a motion to adjourn. I'll second that. I have a motion by Poppin, second by... Commissioner Jibben. Sean, will you call the roll? Commissioner Ahrens? Yes. Commissioner Jibben? Yes. Commissioner Poppins? Yes. Commissioner Schmidt? Yes. Commissioner Landine? Yes. Do you want to go combine now? Well, uh, I hope so. <laughs> I don't know. Good luck. I just. I guess, yeah, well, Ray's going to half inch.